Tonight, Google looking towards space again. Facebook will use your browsing history for ads. Ugh. And European cab drivers block traffic over Uber. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 107 for Thursday, June 12th, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Sky News is reporting that Google's in talks with Virgin Galactic on a deal that would give the search giant access to satellite launch technology and an equity stake in Virgin's $2 billion space tourism venture. Sky News sources tell the network that this is part of Google's goal to put hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit and extend Internet access to billions of people. On Tuesday, Google had announced it was buying Skybox Imaging, a startup satellite venture for $500 million. Skybox develops small, comparatively cheap satellites, which are capable of taking high-quality photographs and videos of the Earth. Now, Virgin Galactic's passenger spacecraft, Spaceship Two, completed its first rocket-powered flight last year. Both Virgin Galactic and Google declined to comment. So file this under rumor for now. But Virgin Galactic Sir Richard Branson and Google co-founder Larry Page have registered the name Virgil for use on potential future business collaborations. So I'll just put that there. Facebook's changing the way it targets you for ads, and you may not like it. The company already allows advertisers to use tracking software to know when you visited a very specific website or an app. Going forward, Facebook won't honor the do not track setting on web browsers. That will allow advertisers to target you based on your interests, which is based on your browsing history. The company will honor the settings to limit ad tracking on iOS and Android devices, though, so sort of different for the web and the apps. Now, while Facebook calls this interest-based advertising and says that this is a common thing throughout the web, which is true... It's also something that Facebook said two years ago it would not do. Things have changed. A new ad preferences tool will start rolling out to U.S. Facebook users in two weeks, which will allow users to tell the company not to show them ads based on their activity in certain categories or select categories that they are interested in. Who is going to do that? Very hard to say. No specific date on when the new targeting will be turned on, but it will eventually. The National Security Agency is facing a number of lawsuits over its surveillance programs, many launched after former NSA contractor Ed Edward Snowden leaked information on the agency's efforts last year. In a hearing last Friday, a U.S. District Court judge reversed an emergency order that had been issued earlier the same week, barring the government from destroying data that the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, had asked to be preserved for that case. The NSA argued they couldn't save it because, quote, a requirement to preserve all data acquired under Section 702, that's the section this pertains to, presents significant operational problems, only one of which is that the NSA may have to shut down all systems and databases that contain Section 702 information. That was written by, written by NSA Deputy Director Richard Leggett in a court filing submitted to the court. Basically, in other words, the NSA says we can't preserve data and still run our agency in a way that is good for the U.S. The debate over preserving data for the lawsuit actually has the EFF now arguing that the government should retain the data, the same data that the group actually wants destroyed eventually. In a brief filed with the court back in May, the EFF said that there was no doubt that the government had already destroyed evidence related to the claims. Ali Rogani, the COO of Twitter, well, former CEO of Twitter, has resigned from his job, appropriately announcing the move via a tweet. According to a company filing, he is staying on as a strategic advisor to CEO Dick Costello, though it's unclear what that role actually entails, if anything. Twitter says it, quote, does not intend to hire a replacement for the COO role, and all of Mr. Rogani's operating responsibilities will be assumed by other members of the Twitter management team. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that Amazon would turn on its rumored music streaming service this week. 
Today they did. The company has officially launched Amazon Prime Music for Amazon Prime subscribers that promises over 1 million songs ready for streaming on top of the downloading service that Amazon already offers. The company has also relaunched its mobile app on iOS as Amazon Music, it used to be Amazon Cloud Player, which now also features access to Amazon Prime Music. Now, as rumored, the service doesn't have most new releases that are offered on competing streaming services. Many of the tracks are at least six months old and nothing from any artist represented by Universal Music. But it's a start. Coming up, ever wondered what you're drinking? <laughs> no, really. What's in here? I don't know. Introducing a smart cup that'll analyze what you're guzzling. But first, we're joined by Lisa Fleischer, reporter for the Wall Street Journal, who is joining us from London. Hello, Lisa. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Or good evening. Um, and <laughs> thanks for being on Tech News tonight, because I know you were on Tech News today earlier in your day. Let's talk about Uber, uh, especially the fact that you are based in London because there have been some extreme protests happening not only in London but across Europe against the company, which is based in the U.S. What is the protest actually supposed to be about? So um, Uber has been operating in London for the past couple of years, and it, it uh, allows uh, people to get private hire taxis, which are sort of like, you know, your livery cabs, um, anything that you don't use as a street hail here in London in particular. Um, but the drivers don't have to necessarily go through all the rigorous training and go have all the um, uh, rules and regulations that some of these regular black cabs in London would have to do. And the black cabs in London here are similar to like the yellow cabs in New York City. You just hail them off the street um, and they have a lot of requirements. Uh, and they say that the Uber drivers are acting almost basically like black cabs, except they don't have to um, follow the same uh, rigorous uh, requirements that they do. Um, so the the drivers aren't actually protesting the technology here. What they're protesting is the application of it. Um, they're saying that the uh, Transport for London, which is the regulator here, isn't regulating, isn't um, following the law, isn't, isn't, isn't enforcing the law, I should say. Now, I, last time I was in London, I used an app called Halo, which was a way yep. to hail a cab driver that was a registered cab driver in London, worked really nicely. Why doesn't Uber try to have some sort of a relationship like that? So as a customer, I could just choose whichever app I liked better. Aha, well, let me tell you what happened yesterday. As thousands of cabs were preparing to clog downtown London, central London, Uber said it was going to do just that. It's going to work. It said it was going to offer its services to black cabs so that basically all it did was provide an electronic way for you to pay and hail a cab. Um, it has to, the, the reason why the reason why the cabs are protesting, of course, are these very technical issues here. But um, yesterday, uh, in, a, in a conveniently timed uh, announcement, Uber said it would be working with the black cabs. So that's, I guess, a step in the right direction. Another thing that happened, though, is, well, who loses here? If there's a protest on, on this big of a scale, the people who actually need to get a ride somewhere get frustrated. And it ended up uh, that the Uber app jumped in. I think uh, on the UK iTunes um, popularity uh, pop, uh, app popularity. They said, that, they said that there were nine nine times as many downloads as the previous week. Right. So it's 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 sort of this. There, there's there's so much publicity about Uber and also people who are frustrated that it ends up not only giving Uber a lot of PR, but in fact because it is a product that a lot of people do like, which is why the the, the, the old cab uh, system is feeling so threatened, you know, they, it has the potential to get people to stop using the old way of doing cabs already. I, I guess I guess I'm wondering what what is the point of the protest if it's just pushing people into the into the arms of the company that they don't like in the first place? No, it's a good question. And some of the cab drivers I spoke with themselves said, like, this isn't necessarily the right way. There's been a lot of criticism of the protests because they said, look, you're just driving people to Uber. Um, I talked to this one CTO who was in town uh, yesterday, and he said that he had gotten out of a meeting and they didn't really know what was happening. They were trying for 25 minutes to get a cab and somebody finally told them what was going on. So, I mean, I assume they just kind of jumped on their phones and got, got a different, uh, uh, or they tried to get a different cab. Um, but uh, you're right. I mean, they are definitely um, 
driving a lot of people towards towards Uber, at least just name recognition, having people download the app and see what it's all about. Um, I think that you know the 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 protests in London in particular were um, more political than than you know actually trying to get people to take black cabs. Um, they wanted to show their strength and they wanted to show the mayor and the mayor's administration that they were someone that, they, that you know, they could cause serious disruption, that they were, they should be taken seriously. Okay, well, there have been protests. Uh, Uber said, as as you noted earlier, that uh, it's already said, oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll actually work with these cab companies to make everybody a little bit happier. Is that enough? Is is Does, does then it turn into a, a, a case of what Uber is taking from a, what the cab driver would pocket as a fare? Cool. So um, Uber basically takes then, I think, 5% of a uh, cab's fare. Um, of course, then the cab has the convenience of not having to, you know, drive around the streets trying to find somebody to, 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 to pick up. Um, but I, and I, the Uber says that that's less than some of the other apps, what they charge for commission like Halo or Get Taxi, some of the other apps that are um, prevalent in London. Um, you know, but I think that the next step here in London is going to be whether a court, so this is actually, this could go to the courts. Um, one of the particular issues here is that uh, black cabs are supposed to be the only ones that are allowed to use a meter to, to get a fare or to um, determine a fare. Now, whether your Uber app that's on your phone, because it's, it's calculating on your phone time and distance uh, to calculate the fare, whether that constitutes a meter or not, it kind of comes down to the question of whether it's actually installed in the phone, whether it's hooked up, I guess, to the, the engine of some sort. This could go to the courts, and um, the transportation agency could ask the courts to, to just come down and have a ruling on that. What's your best guess on how this will all play out? What, what is the Uber situation going to look like across Europe in six months, say? Well, look, I mean, they've just gotten another billion dollars of, uh, of, of, of investment, uh, I think a lot of that is said to be prepping for some of these fights, for some of these battles, because they're trying to get into these markets in whatever way they can. I mean, some the, every every type of Uber you're going to get in every different city around Europe it, it could, is going to be slightly differently. The way that the, the type of cars used, the way they're allowed to be in the markets or not. Um, and I think we're going to definitely see a lot of this stuff end up um, in the political realm, in the courts, so that at some point they're going to have to figure out how the regulations uh, work or how that they how they should be updated um, or whether you know what uber is doing in some of these cities should just be allowed lisa fleischer reports for the wall street journal joining us from london thanks so much for being with us lisa thanks for having me absolutely all right we talked about smart cups and i'm going to tell you a little bit more about it now what does the term smart cup mean to you actually well vessel a new product from a company called mark one which is based in san francisco of course announced today that their smart cup will identify and track what you drink and how much of it and can do so on the fly because it's sensing the liquid type and even breaking it down to components as soon as the liquid interacts with the cup sensor filled interior. I am not kidding. The company says it wants to transform how we all drink an ounce of liquid throughout the day because it can tell us things like how much caffeine is in that drink, how much sugar is in it, the calorie count. They also have a proprietary metric for hydration they call Prime, that's Prime with a Y. It's all tracked through an app on your phone and then information is also displayed on a screen that's embedded within the cup itself. Mark One says it will sell the vessel on its website and has a pre-order campaign seeking to raise $50,000 plans to deliver the first batch by early next year in 2015. The initial pre-order price will be $99 and the cup will retail for $199. It's a lot of money for a smart cup, but hey, it's smart. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also write in with question, comments, and feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss tech news today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Sarah Lane. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.